You are listening to WHO Way Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. Today on the show, we have Jesse Levin, the founder of Tactivate, a company that brings entrepreneurial solution engineering to global disaster zones and strategies from the military special operations veteran and disaster response communities to rapidly launch startups. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. <laughs> So I hope you got, but Ben, like, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So, Ty, I met Jesse, what, your fiance's son? Partner, fiance, close enough. What is it? Partner. Partner, yeah. so, okay. Um, son was on my soccer team, because <laughs> I coach soccer, and that was the first time I met Jesse, and when I found out he was an entrepreneur doing all these like crazy awesome things, I'm like, dude, I'm like, people people like this exist in Gainesville? Oh my gosh, we totally have to get you on the podcast and talk about this, because I just knew it'd be very interesting to discuss, yeah, and, sure. and something that you're not gonna hear a lot of. I mean, in terms of your normal business, it's definitely not what you would expect, I guess. I mean, that's kind of like par for the course in Gainesville. There's all kinds of characters running around yeah. this place. <laughs> so I was like, man, like let's get him on the podcast, and like let's, let's talk about this, you know? So, um, dude, thanks so much for being here. Um, we're gonna dive into your origin story a little bit. I wanna go, I like to go back to like how you even became an entrepreneur and, and found this journey. But before we do that, let's check in with Ty. What's going on? Best of gains Gainesville world. It's, this is airing the week before graduation. We got graduation this yeah. Saturday. Yeah, congrats to all the uh, fall 2018 graduates. Pretty awesome. Oh yeah. Our donut um, extravaganza went pretty well last week, I think. <laughs> Hopefully it was a huge success. Yeah, it was a huge success. <laughs> I um, can. Yeah, just uh, just grinding. Uh, it's been an interesting fall. I actually just started doing acupuncture, which is uh, kind of interesting. I didn't realize Gainesville was such a hub for really for acupuncture. Is it? Yeah, we've no got idea. one of the biggest colleges like in the world. Five points, so or five elements. How did it like? Did it meet your expectations, or did you have yeah, expectations? Yeah, I've been kind of blown or? away. Yeah. Really? Yeah, very uh, something I've wanted to do for a while. Just got just got started. So I had my tr second treatment yesterday, and it's been going pretty well. Okay. Yeah. You have any big plans for the holidays? Um, nothing I want to release yet. So, <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. All right. Maybe I next time. We're podcast. just gonna chill. Yeah. I think my family and I are just gonna chill in Gainesville and stay home. And yeah, I'll be out of relax. the country. Just, yeah. Yeah. Oh dang. Yeah. You're not gonna tell us yet. Not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jesse? Got anything going on for the holidays, man? Uh, so far, heading up to Connecticut, see mom and pops. Yeah. A bit. Is that where you're from? So I'm from originally. Oh, okay. So pop collar, pink pants, bow shoes, the whole night. <laughs> cool. And then for Christmas, uh, we'll see still up in the air. Awesome, man. Well, excellent. Well, again, thanks for being here. Why don't you like, we always like to go dive into the origin stories. It's just a great place to start and hear how you became an entrepreneur and how you started doing all these crazy things. So why don't you take us way back into Way, the day. way back. <laughs> give, us, give us your story, man. Got it. Um, so yeah, I was that guy in, in school, like the typical story was bouncing off the wall, like severely AD, ADHD, as they say, and uh, always loved to learn, but never really kind of fit that, that mold. And kind of got into business early, I, I realized I never really wanted to work for someone and just kind of wanted to make a living doing all this fun stuff I had kind of kept stumbling upon. So started, I think I got cut my teeth. I had a, uh, what I call like a guerrilla marketing firm in, in high school. And really what it was, I wanted to buy this boat, this like 33 foot military inflatable, you know, crazy thing that the SEALs had used. And I was trying to find sponsors to, to purchase things. I was like, what, well, I was like 14 years old at the time. And Sobe, which is like this, this beverage company way back in the day, old school. Man, I used to yeah, love Sobe drinks. Sobe, yeah. They had the, like, that little under the cap and everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they were actually local, and I went in to talk to the guys, and like, you know, hey man, we're not gonna buy a boat, but I'm kinda like where you're coming from, just keep thinking. Um, and I cooked up something called adrenaline marketing, and basically went back to them and said, hey look, you know, you guys are trying to target people my age, I think you can do a much better job. You know, here's what I, here's what I, I should do, we should do. And ended up contracting them and running, uh, all kinds of stuff, the gravity games and X games, and essentially I was into extreme sports and I found a way to bring all my friends and my dog to go and get paid to run around these things and do everything but get arrested was the only rule. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how we got into it. Um, and then you know, I, I always wanted to travel, so I figured if I got my captain's license, I could travel around the world and get paid to do it, and just kind of kept rolling into things like this, which led to this pretty unconventional life. Um, after school, went to Babson, did all kinds of wild stuff there. That was a very entrepreneurial school. It's all I focused on. Uh, ended up moving to Panama, 
and really got into the world, which I'm currently still involved with, which was this austere environment, logistics, culture mediation, um, foreign direct investment development side of the house. Um, and there, basically spent a year being a farmer running around and, and teaching the farmer's kids English and figuring the place out and what the game was and what was really happening. Um, and started uh, an investment advisory and consulting firm where we were basically running around the jungle helping locals not getting taken advantage of, helping foreigners invest appropriately and correctly and not, not getting taken advantage of as well. And in the middle, dealing with the indigenous populations who usually tend to get caught and stuck um, and in doing that because we were operating in very uh, areas kind of 15 to 20 years ahead of the curb, if you will, where there was no infrastructure, roads, or what have you. We got into all kinds of an austere environment logistics and disaster response work because we were the only ones that had the capability to kind of get out there in times of an emergency and there was all kinds of drug running and crazy stuff going on. So that got us to where, uh, where we are today. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you get bored easy? Uh, I don't, no. No? Okay, like I just feel like it seems like you just, I mean, obviously, it's just a passion for adventure, it sounds like, because it's just like on to the next and kind of, like you said, kind of rolls over from one thing to the next. There's a lot of churn and burn, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, talk a little bit about where you're at now, um, because I know that you spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico, Yep. Um, and that was after the hurricane yep. that hit down there, but you've also been in Haiti after Right, was it Haiti with, after the earthquake and stuff? Haiti, Philippines. Yeah. Yeah, so that last story ended off, we ended up um, in doing all this, this work with all these, these crazy people and making sure folks didn't kill each other and figuring out how to get things done in, in less than conventional environments. We started Tactivate, which is what we're, we're working on these days. And that was about 2011, right after Haiti earthquake, which is where I went, um, ended up just volunteering with a, a joint Latin American uh, search and rescue task force. And ended up hooking up with this guy, uh, Mike Stewart, who was a former Naval Independent Hospital corpsman, and he was running a small organization called Hope for Haiti. Uh, had a couple people working with him, um, and we had spent about six months triaging, doing last mile, building field hospitals, uh, water systems, and basically that's where I really learned and realized the power of applying an entrepreneurial approach to, to aid. And there's a lot of issues that plague that, that world that are very similar to business. Um, and since then, you know, we, we started Tactivate um, basically with the idea that there's a lot you can apply from the military special operations community to launching companies, and uh, there's a lot you can take from the entrepreneurial world to sol solving problems in disaster zones. Um, so, you know, we did Haiti, we've done the Philippines, we've helped all kinds of amazing organizations like Team Rubicon, which is a veteran disaster response startup when they got going in 2010. Uh, and then, you know, since then, we launched, you know, all kinds of companies, been involved in all kinds of startups. Uh, and most recently have just spent the past year in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, because that was a very interesting type of response. Um, did all kinds of wild stuff down there. Yeah, I mean, tell me a little bit about the, how it's different than a traditional response team that would be sent to Puerto Rico to go help. Yeah, so, so Puerto Rico is a, a, is a crazy beast. Like it, doesn't, it didn't really fit the mold that we had for disaster response, because FEMA was technically in charge because it's a territory of the US, but FEMA is a, there's a lot of misconceptions of what that organization can do. They are a basically pretty much a funding and advisory group that gets behind local government. They don't do any kind of last mile direct response with the exception of urban search and rescue. So the entire island had a, had a misunderstanding of what FEMA could do and they really, what they needed was local government to do things and they were expect, waiting for FEMA to do stuff, which FEMA just wasn't legally mandated or structured to, to handle. So typically in aid, it's very top down, it's very, it's very top heavy. You know, it's really well intentioned, but these organizations and groups come in and say, oh, we gotta save the day, we've gotta bring water and food, and there's absolutely an acute life-saving period when that's necessary. And granted, every disaster, whether it's a Haiti or you know, flooding in Panama or whatever is very different, more often than not, we found that the greatest capacity to respond is local community themselves, right? And what happens in these things is the, the economy gets absolutely decimated. Right? And especially with subsistence living and these local merchants, everyone tries to do the best they can. They try to be resources for their community. But what happens when all of a sudden you've got hundreds of thousands of metric tons of food and water and supplies that come in that are being given away for free? Or you know, all these you know, thousands of, of federal laborers who come in who completely change the labor market. So it really disrupts organic recovery. So what we, we do is we kind of go in and we get very last mile, you know, very outside the traditional wire, if you will. Uh, and we, we find people who speak the language, whether it's you know, local tiny NGOs or entrepreneurs or artists or taxi drivers, whatever the case may be, and we find out what's really happening on the ground, what capacity exists, what are the locals trying to fix, 
which is very often different than what the traditional aid community is addressing. Uh, and then because we, we, you know, we speak FEMA or we speak UN or we speak military or we speak NGO, we can duck into those organizations very informally and kind of under the radar and take resources that wouldn't typically get allocated and bring them back underneath the, the last mile operators or the small local entrepreneur who's really dug into the community uh, with a bottom up approach. So what did that mean for Puerto Rico when you guys went in there? Or like, what's, like what's the first thing that you, I mean, you walk into a disaster zone, what's the first thing that enters your mind and then like, where do you start? It's kind of like a music festival, you know. It's like it's the same folks that are responding all around the world. It's like this crazy energy, and actually, disasters are, are, are horrible because they, you know, they, they affect, they impact life really negatively in a lot of cases. But it also brings out the best in people, like the impacted communities. Everyone rallies together. You know, the the types of solutions that are being actioned are incredible. There's this huge energy, and it's palpable. You know, whether you're you're with traditional aid or you're outside traditional aid or you're just working in the local community. Um, but what we do is we we mine our networks before we get there. We say, hey, who do we know? We're coming in, you know. Who can we get connected with? Whether that's college alumni networks or just a disaster response network or, or what have you. We get really creative there. And so we hit the ground, we usually have a point of contact. Um, in Puerto Rico, it happened to be a friend of mine, Steve Bierenbaum, who I've worked with, who I call the uh, Santa Claus of SATCOM, because you can call this guy and you can be standing on some remote island in the Philippines, like, hey, bro, I need, I need communications. And all of a sudden, the SATCOM unit just falls out of the sky with like, free connectivity. <laughs> it's like, no, don't worry about it, buddy. <laughs> um, so he was there, and he actually called me down to kind of get involved. And so he was really tied in with FEMA and the whole network already. Um, and yeah, what I did, I, got, I just got in a Jeep, and I put a pin on, on a map that looked in a really remote area, and I just started driving around. Um, I got way out there and started to see, you know, what was really happening, what infrastructure was really, you know, impugned, what was the status of things, what resources existed that people weren't talking about, and how did the, what we call the ground truth, which is the reality, differ from what the media or local aid organizations were talking about back at the JFO, which is a joint field operation, which is where there's 3,000 FEMA employees sitting in this huge air-conditioned stadium. Um, so one thing we realized and I go on a long rant, but the, the short and long of the, what we did in Puerto Rico was an economic stability project and food security. So we, all of these uh, local mom and pop tiendas, they called pantarias, were, were open. And all the locals that realized a huge storm was coming, got a generator, you know, stocked up on fuel, had huge backstocks of food and water. And they were, they were doing the best they could to operate and serve as a, as a resource for their community, obviously. They were giving away what they could, they were helping. But they're, they're businesses. And our philosophy is like, you know, businesses, as long as they can provide continuity of service, right? as long as they can do what they're structured to do in the aftermath of a disaster, you don't need disaster response. If banks can provide capital despite no connectivity, if supermarkets can keep food cold and get resupplied, you don't need food, right? So we try to get those local resources just back up and running. And the problem was all of the aid and FEMA saying, hey, there's no food and water in Puerto Rico. And they're spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars shipping all of this stuff onto the island and then dealing with all the disaster and logistics of getting it distributed. In point of fact, it was all local, it was localized. There, there was food and water everywhere, but people couldn't get access to it because there's no connectivity. So zero point of sale systems, zero ATMs, so you couldn't get cash. And 45% of the island uses EBT, which is food stamps, which is in the form of a credit card. So what had happened is the, the local merchants lost their purchasing power and or selling power and the local people lost their, their buying power. So you, there was no commerce, so you couldn't get access to this stuff. So we said, okay, well, we can kind of fix that pretty quickly. And um, we socialized the issue. We brought it to the you know, government, to the military. I said, holy crap, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But because of bureaucracies, it's, it's slow, right? You can't get things going quickly, which is where entrepreneurship comes in. So we said, okay, you know, Steve found a technology that worked, an M2M -M satellite, which is a tiny little satellite unit that cost about 1,200 bucks. We bought a ton of these things from this awesome group called Focus Mission. It was another, you know, for-profit but social impact company that was operating in, you know, the storm. So, hey, we've got this technology on island. We can get a whole lot more quickly. And these guys were brilliant connectivity experts. And we put together a working group and we, we scrounged some air support from, you know, through FEMA and DOD. And we flew all around the island and installed a bunch of these units and got these markets up and running. And we spent about, I don't know, 33000 bucks. And in the first couple months, millions and millions of dollars of transactions have been put through the systems because the folks were selling food and water. They were decreasing their need in external aid. And the local economy was getting rocking and rolling. That's a, that's that's the last example, the big project. <laughs> Dang, how long? I mean, how long did it take? Like, what's that? How long is that process? Like, when you figured out, okay, like let's get these satellites, let's get this, let's going. Like, how long did it take before things were? Before uh, we got things up and running. You know, within a day, my buddy had written a white paper. We had, he'd kind of identified the technology. Our mistake was we then because you you try to involve all parties so you don't operate in silo. 
because the challenge in aid is everyone is doing a lot of the same stuff and there's a lot of redundancy of effort because no one talks to each other. So try not to recreate that same mistake. We took this, this thing that we had realized and tried to bring it to all the appropriate parties. You know, that was a FEMA, DOD, local government. So, hey guys, like this is a major economic stability issue and this is a major food security problem. We think we have a really easy, quick fix. And everyone said 100% absolutely we're behind it, but they couldn't move quick enough. So we spent about a week and a half trying to socialize and get support for it as opposed to just doing it. And that really held us up. So when I realized that wasn't gonna move fast enough, we just took the Amex and started spending and started doing. Uh, I think we probably, probably I'd say from idea to first implementation was probably two and a half weeks. Okay. Well, how do like how do you pay for this stuff? Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm saying like are you, you're not a non for profit, are you? No, no. Um, okay. we, my life would be a lot easier if we were, but we've been trying for years to prove. And I know this sounds kind of cliche, and everyone talks about triple bottom line and you know social impact investing and all that kind of stuff. But we think NGOs are certainly a need for them. They're awesome, but they're also super unsustainable. And all of our buddies who run them, who you know amazing impact, they spend all of their time raising money as opposed to actually doing the mission. Mm. Second part is they typically have very strict bylaws and they have a kind of a standard operating procedure that they have to kind of follow. So that doesn't necessarily apply, especially in the world of humanitarian assistance and disaster response, the needs are always different. And this is definitely a generalized statement, but we wanted to be super dynamic, we wanted to be super sustainable, we wanted to be able to fly, like just go as fast as we could, so we decided, you know, we'll fund ourselves. So we, the way we fund ourselves is we launch companies. You know, we've done all kinds of stuff, you know, bars, um, climbing gyms, co-working spaces. We do all kinds of expeditions with entrepreneurs, special operations veterans, and we just take that cash flow from uh, you know either equity raises or we take a buyout or whatever the case may be, and we draw down on that capital to both sponsor disaster response projects and to bootstrap our next next venture. Sometimes it works really well, and sometimes- So you're using other businesses to yeah. fund this business Correct. of doing good. Yeah, I, 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 call, I call it triple P, which is our personal path to poverty. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. It's super cool. So it's, it's work. I mean, Puerto Rico definitely challenged our model because typically we'll support and deploy groups for like two to three weeks, maybe a month. We were in Puerto Rico for a year. So that was, you know, we took a huge footprint, spent a whole lot of money. Um, so that makes things more challenging, but we always seem to figure it out. How big is like the team that you like that you took there? Um, initially, it? yeah, initially it was me and one guy, okay. um, who my buddy Steve who called me down, and then we've got a whole group of people we've worked with for years, both in the startup and disaster response kind of ecosystem. So we don't keep people on staff; we just we just build teams as we go. Um, so there's probably about ten of us working on this project, all said and done. You know, we recruited a local foundation. We were working directly with the uh, CIO, of the Puerto Rican government. Um, so we had, a, we had a good group working on this. And these are like formal special ops guys a lot of the times or? So those, those are folks I'll bring with me. We only actually only brought one down to, uh, to Puerto Rico, a, a guy who just got out of SEAL Team 6. Um, great, great young guy. Um, and basically we, we do two things. We've got a sort of a live fire apprenticeship mentorship program where when, when they transition out of the military, they come with us and they either spend a couple months launching a business or they come with us on a disaster deployment. And we, A, they're teaching us all kinds of stuff. They're helping us connect. Their, their skill set is obviously super valuable. It's very much a two-way exchange, and we always end up learning more from them than they're able to gain from us. Um, but we get to understand their body language, what they want to do, where they've come from, and then we can help them get funding, start their business, get them plugged into a bigger company. Or in the rare occasion we actually have a cash flowing business, <laughs> we keep them on, and they can run, you know, they can run operations with us. How do you find them? Where did they find you? Um, it's word of mouth. You know, we're super under the radar. Yeah, um, super under the radar. Yeah. <laughs> like the fact that we found you, I'm like, this is this is like one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard of, and it's like fascinating yeah. to me. And I'm like, this exists. Like what? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's intentional. You know, we're I'm a civilian, um, and you know, working in the military community, I've got to be very careful. Like, there's a line I'll never be able to cross. My organization can never cross because we're not prior service. And then one of the ways that we vet ourselves is that if you know people who come through our program find it valuable, it's a very small community, and they refer us to the next person. Um, the same thing goes for disaster response and, and in business. You know, we just at this point we're just kind of being discovered. Um, but again, our objective is not to be this massive, you know, hugely scaled organization with you know twenty thousand Facebook likes. Um, you know, our our we need to kind of be very dynamic and lethal in how we operate, and that goes for the size of our teams and who we have on our team. So it's kind of why we, we keep quiet. What happens from the, you know, when you go into Puerto Rico and your typical response time or the time that you spend there is two to three months and it ends up being a year? I mean, are, 
are you risking these other businesses that are funneling you cash for this? Like, like have you lost one of your other businesses um, that's funneling the cash for Tactivate? No. Okay. Not yet. Um, so basically, so again, we, we don't make any money in disaster response. Like that's all volunteer. Right. And we do that because if you have to make money in disaster response, it's not a bad thing at all, but there's, very, there's this really weird dynamic where people, you're either an NGO or you're a disaster capitalist, right? You're there to exploit. Um, and we think that's a really detrimental paradigm. So we've been trying to, to change that. Um, NGO is just tons of money out there. It's super easy to raise money. It's super easy to work with DOD or the government. It's not if you're for profit, which is what we are. So we have to ensure we have funding. Now, like I said, Puerto Rico is challenging, you know, because we were in the, in the midst of had sold out of one project, didn't have a for-profit project going on, and just ended up focusing on Puerto Rico. So we hustled. Um, we had a team house that I started, um, which was first kind of a place just for our guys to crash, and we brought everybody together, military, FEMA, local entrepreneurs, and have this kind of crazy underground organic, you know, speakeasy, if you will. And that we kind of turned that into a place where lodging was very, very expensive in Puerto Rico because there's so many federal employees and so many hotels had closed. So we had these awesome apartments, which I rented and sublet and, you know, and made enough to sustain operations for the remainder of our time down there. Okay. But it was definitely scrappy. Yeah. yeah. But, if you, but, if but you, it's cool. It's like, I mean, that's when you know somebody has that entrepreneurial DNA, the fact that you can just go in and do that and, and not rely on, you know, other people, I guess, necessarily to just to be able to go in and start something and cash flow yourself. Got to move quick. And also, it also probably would be really disturbing if you guys understood what the per diems were per federal employee, what they got to spend per night per person. Yeah, it's bad. It's real business. Yeah. <laughs> so Dang. Um, what you got, Ty? Um, I'm going to get to some other things. But just on the Puerto Rico stuff, um, the hat you're wearing, the mortar and pistol, um, I'm watching the video over here. It's kind of like a survival and emergency readiness training bar and cultural events workspace. Yep, it's a pretty a pretty cool uh, definition. So is that you guys come in say say this happens somewhere else? You come in and you guys kind of uh, you go through the same system, cultivate those local relationships, boots on the ground, figure it out. But you leave that footprint behind, kind of for next time when there is a next time in Puerto Rico. You've got this system already kind of built out and you've got those local people so 10 days before the disaster they're more ready right and that's kind of what you guys are doing all over the place is preparing them for next time yeah that's, I mean, that's an awesome there's i could dig into that question for forever yeah. um so yes our whole thing is we call it proactive readiness right so we use a response as a if you're just always responding you're, you're failing you're behind the eight ball right but if you come up with a system and a methodology where you're training people you're putting systems in place it's called future proofing so for example this these point of satellite point of sale systems we put in all these local tiendas are still in place and they're still activated. Yep. Which means next time there's a, there's a storm, we're not gonna have the same problem. Yep. Now that's just one tiny micro example, uh, but we work very hard to build indigenous capacity to cultivate a network of people that we can tap back into and that are now trained and prepared to handle X, Y, and Z. And the same thing for business. You know, like for mortar and pistol, for example, we spent a year in, in Miami and we just kind of sussed out, we had an idea. We, we, everything that we do in all of our ventures, whether it's the climbing gyms or the, the nightclubs, is we're trying to figure out how to socialize this concept of readiness. Like, how do you do what CrossFit did for fitness to prepare people? Not like, not like for a zombie apocalypse, like the world is ending right wing militaristic perspective, but you know, I, went to, I grew up going to survival school. And I learned, when I was like, maybe by the time I was 13 years old, I could walk into the woods with a knife and actually have a blast providing for my friends and my family if like something happened, right? And that sounds like an extreme statement, but really the way I took that is like, what do I have to be afraid of? Like uh, if I can enjoy myself in the most fundamental base root situation, that did change my perspective, it changed my baseline. And we're trying to do that for people on scale. And we wanna find a way that people aren't gonna go to a survival school, people aren't gonna go to a tactical training school, people aren't gonna go to an EMT course. So we've used these ventures, mortar and pistol being one of them, to start experimenting with how do you expose people to like the idea of using a med kit? How do you expose people to the idea of like what situational awareness means and being aware of your environment and how to react and how to identify threats? And what we found is it's a really empowering modality. Like when you learn to take care of yourself and others, it affects every facet of your life. It changes how you run your business, how you build your teams, how you are in your relationships. Uh, and Modern Pistol, you know, we've had to adapt that per market. We went, to, we went into Miami, and it's actually a doozy of a project. Um, and we said, you know, what's going on in Miami? This is awesome startup scene. It's kind of like Gainesville, right? There's tons of artists, there's tons of entrepreneurs, but there's no real healthy place where everyone's congregating. 
And there's actually another woman there, Della, uh, who, you know, she wanted to do a food truck. And, you know, we had this more of a hybridized background. And we said, I think we should do this a crazy, you know, health, gaming, you know, entertainment, you know, farm to table survival training outfit. And we concocted this idea, um, ended up handing it off to her because we had to do some stuff with veterans on the West Coast. She launched it and turned it much more into a, you know, food lab. We ended up getting back involved, you know, two or three months after the fact when she launched it. Um, and, and created the Mortar and Pistol brand, which was this, this bar people are used to drinking. It was a way for us to disguise it. We had a lot of veterans involved. And we did things like tequila and tourniquets and you know, brunch where we had you know, lock picking and how to get out of flex cuffs. And we were just exposing people in a really fun way to you know, stress inoculation and keeping calm under duress and you know, all these kind of cool, funky little things. Yeah, that's awesome. So this, this is, I mean, I just want to be clear, this is one of the businesses that you guys helped you and that helps fund Tactivate? That, yeah, that was, so that one was, was um, we, we actually had some issues with the legal structuring on that one, to say the least. Okay. Um, you know, there's a million different types of entrepreneurs. There's like, I call it the zero to one, which are the, the you know, can take an idea conceptually and mechanically, you know, permitting, dealing with P and Z, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's not us, right? Um, that's that's a, a type of person like Adela. You know, we, we, we're really great. Once you put us into a box, we can, we fly, we're like two to, two to five two to four, building team, strategy, PR, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this one, we actually, you know, we had a bunch of, call it friction with, with, the, with the co-founder. And because she had launched it with somebody else, um, you know, we, we ended up taking a buyout and had to walk away from that one. But that okay. is one of the businesses that, yes, would, is an example, would fund Tactivate. How many of these businesses are there? Past projects? Yeah. And there was Escobar. There was uh, from bars, Escobar, Modern Pistol, the Brooklyn Boulders, which we did, Boston and Chicago, the Active Collaborative Workspace. Um, we've done team houses in Miami, all the stuff in Puerto Rico. Um, so do you like still own like a lot of these things or is the strategy very much like, okay, like we'll get it up, get it going, sell it and take the cash? That's, that's been like the, the need. Okay. Um, it would be great if we could keep more of a vested interest. Okay. We, still have, we still have a little bit of chunks in like Brooklyn Boulders, for example, which I just discovered, which is great because that's like an extra, you know, kick when we need it. Um, but, you know, in order to sustain what we're doing now with Puerto Rico, we have to be able to keep more of a, of a long-term equity play in these businesses. That's kind of how we're evolving. Gotcha. What's the craziest thing that you've seen? Like going into a disaster zone. <laughs> I'm just kind of, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm like, I'm just... I'm trying to picture myself going into one of the, you know, going into Haiti or going into Puerto Rico. You know, you, I, you know, we all see what we see on Facebook and stuff, and you know, there's that. But it's like, you know, I'm just kind of, I want to, I want like a story or like, or, or maybe like an inspiring thing, something that you just saw that's just like, oh my gosh, seeing that these people come together to yeah, yeah. achieve the impossible, or you know, for sure. Yeah, I got, I got good ones. Uh, I, I'd say both Haiti for for that. I mean, Haiti was a mess. And like the course, I think it was like what, 90 seconds, 250,000 people died, right? right? And then after that from you know, secondary infection, and I mean, it was well over 350. I mean, it was just cataclysmic. I mean, everybody in the entire island, you know, country lost someone or, or multiple people. Um, it, was, it, was, it was an apocalypse. You walked into a true, no kidding, like end of world Mad Max scene. It was, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, so from like a disaster porn, like what is one of the craziest things I've ever seen is you had uh, you know, like literally stray dogs and pigs, like eating people, essentially. There's like people just stuck in rubble. And, you know, you look over and you're like, that, that pig is eating, you know, an arm. And I definitely, you know, I, I swore off pork for a little while after that, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, it was a pretty, pretty nasty, nasty thing. But also, like, you know, at the same time, you know, I was driving, we were, we were helping to set up an IDP camp, which is this internally displaced persons camp in Carfu. There's 10,000 people living in tents, and we built a field hospital and helped help establish a water system. And you had to drive through a pretty, like, you know, the whole place was pretty gnarly and pretty nasty, but there's this particular, particular stretch which was just, like, you know, ravaged. And no one had any homes. Everyone was living in the street, right? And they were living in tents or tarps, whatever they could find. And I just remember, like, looking out the truck window and down at this probably 85, 90 year old woman, and she had set up like a shower curtain for her privacy in, this, in the median of the street. Like this elegant, like everyone is just super clean and just, you know, I don't know how they took care of themselves, but just maintain like this, this level of, of, 
they're proper. I don't know how else to describe it. And she's sitting there, and she's this huge smile on her face. And I said, like, "Como ye, madam? Like, you know, what's up? Like, you know?" And she's like, "Ah, nous pousse nous la, like, or nous pousse nous la, or, or when she's like, na poule, which like we're here, we're chilling, I'm on fire, you know, like that's like the common response in Haiti. And I, I was like, this it just blew my mind, you know. Driving by, she's sitting on an, like, an uh, like the plastic crate in the shower curtain in the middle of the road, it has nothing, and she's just chilling and smiling and happy and waving and and. Uh, that, I think, is emblematic, generally speaking, of what happens to people in community in the aftermath of this because you start talking to people and you start connecting and you start, you know, helping. And, like, you know, things are happening. Like I saw this one guy duct tape a bunch of, like, you know, 3G and 4G cell phone hotspots together, hooked it up to, like, a, an actual hands, headset and had, like, a telecommunications, like, call center in the middle of the tent camp, you know? <laughs> like, charging, like, you know, 50 cents a call. Like, this is amazing, man. You know, it's incredible to see this stuff. Thing. All right, what else, man? <laughs> so, so when you're down there and you develop this kind of community of all people from all sorts of backgrounds and different types of people, how do you, after not that it ever really ends, but how do you guys stay in in touch with these people, um, kind of throughout the the rest of not just the situation but into the future? Do you guys use? groups online or any sort of networking what does that look like and how do you guys manage these various communities all over the world so that's an awesome question that's where i need to like hire a techie um, because that's where i fall flat on my face like it's all it's all here it's all yeah. my gmail account you know i've got some spreadsheets but i you know i had a one of my good friends courtney wilson who was a, a combat engineer she also a fellow babson student brilliant woman um, I kind of call her in to fix our life you know when, like from an organizational and operational perspective and she tried to get us going with HubSpot and yeah. you know, all these CRMs and there's all these you know slack chat groups and you know um, you know the, these working groups uh, but again it's so siloed and there's so many of them that we found that we've just cultivated you know what I'll call force multipliers it's like really strategic context contacts uh, that can either put you in touch with someone in certain regions or that are really embedded in certain countries that you know we can make one or two calls and and figure it out and those yeah. are, those are the type of folks that I try to maintain congruency with and like you know I try to keep current um, and then we talk, we just kind of you know I've got great friends from Philippines now and from Haiti and from you know we, we just keep touch um, it's it's not there's no real it's like, like anything else you just you know you got a buddy and it's in the informal relationships both in business and in disaster response that fuel action yeah and so we just kind of keep it real I like that and then kind of looking into the future, are there any locations or countries or things where it's like, you know, if a situation was to take place, you know it would be just a complete disaster and you guys are trying to develop plans or ideas to go in there before, years before um, it could even, because you know, you know, that's where I look at this and it's like from the entrepreneurship side, it's like, you know, you've got these 12 locations you've been to and solve the problem afterwards. Are there, you know, two dozen, three dozen, 50 locations you can get to before it starts? Yeah, we're sitting there. It's yeah. The U.S. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I say like, thank, I don't mean this to sound awful, but I say thank God what happened in Puerto Rico happened in Puerto Rico and not the U.S. Because if that had happened here, it would be like all out bloodshed. And I mean, if you lost power and communications for months on end in New York, imagine yeah. that. Like, the Latin culture and the island culture and the fact that they were used to dealing with like intermittent power kept the island from falling into complete and utter like mayhem, right? It was cultural. If you have anything like that in the US, we don't have a culture of familiarity and, and like, you know, good relations with our neighbors, so to speak. It's just not really typically America. And we're not also, we're also exceedingly dependent on systems, right? Um, I think the US is actually one of the most vulnerable countries because of that. Um, you know, and actually to give you a quick, story, what, what kind of started us on this path is the, the deputy CEO of the Marine Corps at the time, this gentleman named James Kraft, called us into the Pentagon. It's like 2011. And it's like, look, basically, he said, like, look, guys, we're expecting a massive increase in both man-made and natural disasters. Most of our resources are deployed or our budgets have been cut. And, you know, we've got an infrastructure, like an I want infrastructure that really, in a real disaster is going to fail. And more importantly, our population is very dependent. How do we innovate around making people more ready and more resilient? And this was before resiliency was kind of a cool kid term, like thrown around everywhere. That's really got us thinking and got us on this path. But what we're focused on now is like really trying to gamify and, and inculcate a culture of readiness in the U.S. in a way that's super fun, non, you know, terrorist based, non-disaster based, non-reactionary, just very proactive and almost creating 
a new modality. Like I, I keep using the CrossFit you know, model. CrossFit made fitness communal and tribal, and it, it, it worked for a reason. Same thing with Spartan Race and Tough Mudder. Like these things are catching on for a reason. We're after doing the same thing. We're making like, you know, how to use a tourniquet and a med kit as ubiquitous as CPR, for example. Yeah, and that's a, that's the current venture we're working on. And the U.S. is definitely our our country of focus. Thank. <laughs> what would you say? I mean, just from your years as an entrepreneur, what would you say has been your biggest lesson as an entrepreneur? Ooh, um, I think uh, I mean for me, I'm I'm still like obviously learning this every day. But I I try to be really present. Uh, I try to like really enjoy. The moment I know that sounds like you know everyone says you know you've got to be present and you know meditate and take cold showers and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but I think being an entrepreneur, I'm sure you know this, like is, is actually super stressful. You know, it takes a long time to find your stride. Like you know, I think you found here, um, it, it's a lot of work, and especially like, our problem or our challenge or reality is that we are always involved with the hardest phase. Like we launch, like we launch, we launch, we launch, we push, we push, and then when things are stabilized, we're out, and we do it again. Um, and that, that kind of keeps us in this perpetual, like, <gasps> you know, like it's like a, a sprint. Um, and for me, the hardest part is being able to maintain that balance, keep that calm, enjoy the process, uh, and, and and kind of keep things in, in perspective. So what's the most rewarding part? Uh, complete freedom. You know, that's, that's also actually a blessing and a curse. Like, you know, having the ability just to do whatever, go wherever, um, it's been really lovely, but at the same time, like I also thrive with structure, and you know I'm not the best at creating that structure for myself. So when we get into organi- you know projects where we get to align with other other people, other ventures, like that is when we really get to fly because we have some semblance of a box and a structure to work with, uh, which is uh, like going on vacation. It's <laughs> cool. So I wanted to bring it back to Gainesville a little yes. bit. So, so that fascinates me. Um, <laughs> Why is that? I mean, so I did the same thing when I do drop into disaster when I came to Gainesville because I was thinking yeah. about doing a project here. We still are because my, you know, my, my girl is finishing up a residency and I don't sit still well. You ask if I get bored, I get bored if I don't do anything. Right, um, that's, what, that's what I was meaning yeah. really when I asked. Yeah. I go crazy. Um, and so just sitting around like Gainesville, it, Gainesville's cool if you're doing something. It's not so cool if you're just like, hey, I need to go grocery shopping. Like, yeah, yeah. I was going nuts. Yeah. So I started just to map out the ecosystem. And like the course of two weeks, you know, we got to come in and talk to Colin and, and I just met with James at Phalanx. Yeah. yeah. Good <laughs> God, that guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, amazing. Like the, you know, I'm meeting with Craig Fugate this, later this afternoon who used to run FEMA. Yep. I mean, the, the, you know, Kwong, like the cast of characters uh, and Kristen that are, that are running around here and the capacity and what people have done. You know, the guys that did the, is it the toy tech box or tech toy box. I mean, there's just so many interesting people. I think it's a real anomaly. Yeah, Mark. Okay. Mark, yeah. Um, it just blown me away. You know, I think that it's, it's, it's just really, it's like anathema. I mean, it's a, an imperfect sandbox to do something to experiment with. There's just brilliant minds and brilliant capacity. Um, and I've just enjoyed it. So far, all I've done is just meet people. You yeah. know? And we have a project that we're eyeing on to do. We would never typically look at Gainesville as a, as a market for us because we're, we're in very urban-centric, urban cores, you know, Miami, Boston, Chicago. Um, but there's a potential we do kind of a, a sort of pop up here to, to further test the concept we're working on. Yeah, I would just from my perspective, it's it'd be a great place to land all sorts of ambassadors from all over the world. Um, it's such a melting pot of great minds and just different ideas and people that have been and come from everywhere. Um, I love that the uh, tequila and tourniquets. You know, those things make sense. You know, for businesses, I could see that happening anywhere in town here. What a, if you could let us, what would the pop-up look like here? Or what were you, what are you thinking? Yeah, so I mean, the next thing we're working on is basically, uh, we're calling it a, a social club for badassery. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's basically like a, uh, you know, people know what a gym is. People know what a bar is. Like people know what entertainment, you know, is they, they, they understand classes. So we've, we've kind of tested over the years to all these different ventures, curriculum and concepts that we could then smash together in one kind of synergistic play that would, give people real access to this kind of world in, in, a, in a seamless fashion. So what we're looking to do next is basically, you know, this is, this, is a social club for badassery totally powered by, you know, off-grid technology so we can exemplify, hey, here's what solar powers, solar panels can do and, you know, wind generation can do and, and here's how you set them up. You know, here's how you use water catchment and how you can, you know, water your own urban garden. And, you know, here, here it is in play in this building. Um, come in and get a workout, but the workouts you're gonna get are, you know, learning how to carry someone if they get hurt. 
you know, learning how to just move through a room tactically, you know, while carrying weight, which teaches you how to, you know, analyze angles and assess threats. Um, you know, learning about emergency medicine. But again, you know, you can grab a beer, you can listen to live music, you can, you know, you can sit at the co-working space and, you know, just meet fascinating people. And the underlying agenda is to provide a platform to cross-pollinate, you know, the veteran community, the first response community, the medical community, the entrepreneurial community, artists, and just bring everybody together to form those informal bonds across those, those resource communities. Yeah. Um, and that's how we found, like, creating that capacity and those networks help people in time of need. That's awesome. Do we have a timeline on this? Uh, I mean, that's a project we're working on, like, full board now, as of a couple weeks ago, like, in the States. Um, whether we do it in Gainesville, like full on or not, is still up in the air because we only have another year or so here. Um, but we're, we're, I'm talking to the Brooklyn Boulders guys again, for example, and we'll see where, you know, we're looking at DC. We'll see where we're going to, we're still looking for the perfect location. Hmm. Cool. How about you guys? Like, this, this place like, kind of blew my mind. <laughs> like, what? The, the first thing I noticed I got to Gainesville, I was like, but what is going on in the scooter mafia here? This, I've never seen anything like this. I like that term, scooter mafia. Yeah. You're welcome, Gainesville. <laughs> <That's a nice laughs> I mean, it's it's crazy just to see how everything's developed over 14 years. You know, like I I often get asked if I ever thought it would turn into this, and I, I think as an entrepreneur, you like you never. I don't think I really had that expectation. It was more of just going after an opportunity. I think, and I don't know. I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate when it comes to that. It's just like, hey, I saw I saw you know students not being able to get to class. I saw a university that was building on every parking lot that they had because they had no more land. <laughs> I saw students that couldn't park their cars on campus. I'm like, all right, this is this is a problem. So for me, like analyzing that problem, I'm like, ah, like I think I can solve it. And I think it, and I do. I think it takes a special person to be like willing to act on that because the execution is everything. So yeah. many people aren't willing to act on it, um, but to look to see the impact, you know, the, how many thousands of scooters, I think, um, well, you, know, well, you talked to in Kristen Joy's class yep. too recently, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I was in one of the other sessions and was sitting there and one of the girls who was presenting had said something like in, 2000, in 2004, there were like 600 scooter decal sold or something like that. It was like some low number. And then last year, 2017, it was like 6,800 decals. And so I think about that. And then in 2004, it was a $30. It was a $30 for a parking decal for a scooter. Now it's like 160. So 160 oh. times 6,800. I'm like, I'm like, dang, this university has made so much money <laughs> off of me. <laughs> yeah, you gotta get, you gotta where's get the kickback? Like, yeah, yeah, where's the kick? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I like look at that. And I'm at like, at least let them put it into your Gator Top Hundred revenue. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> but man, it's just it's it's cool. And then to kind of, just to see how things have played out to where we own this location less than a half mile north of the University of Florida on one of the busiest roads in Gainesville. Just to see how everything evolves. And um, I mean, if you're patient enough and you just keep your head down and work hard and just keep grinding. I think I think that's what happens, you know. It's it's funny. I'm borrowing space from my friends over here at the selling factory, and uh, Ian. Uh, he comes in. He's like, he's like, look, Colin's showing us up because I'm there before. You know, I'm, I'm there first, and I'm the last to leave, and I'm just in there, and I'm just you know working on everything, and it's just, I just love it. Yeah. And I just love it. You're, I don't know if we can talk about this because I, I talked about helping us with another like little fun side project we were working on. But this next thing you're jamming on seems, like, I think it's super exciting. Are can we you, gonna do it? You gonna do it? I, uh, I, that we're, we're, I actually just hired a professional, uh, a professional prototyper because I wasn't happy with what we were getting. Like sewing it at home was not happening. Really? Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's getting real actually. So Jesse's working on a project, and uh, we're we're looking at doing the video for them to help them get get it out there and do cool. a little. We're gonna do a little Kickstarter. I think that's the plan. Although that's I was advised plan? against it because China's gonna steal the idea. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I was advised against Kickstarter, which I don't know. I don't know. Oh, feel that's about that interesting. Yet. So we'll see. We'll have to. You have to stay tuned. Yeah. Till like what's. <laughs> I think it'd be really really cool. cool. But but it, I you know one the, even the opportunity to collaborate with somebody as brilliant as yourself for me is an honor. So like dude I, like I just what? I just think it, I think it'd be fun. Um, I think that's what, some of the really cool stuff that's coming out of the podcast is like just seeing just seeing and hearing about the connections that people are making. Like I hope other people will reach out to you and, and collaborate with you and do incredible things. I don't know if, if this is even a possibility either. I mean, like, do you accept 
donations to your cause or like do you do anything like that no, no? I mean, what, what ends up happening is i've got buddies like just you know everyone's like wants to donate when these things happen and they end up like just sending us cash because okay. they know what we're doing and we like use one th you know one thousand percent of it just to fund the operations we're not like no one's paying themselves or anything um but we don't we're not set up to take donations you know we're, okay. i like again i wish we were because life would be so much easier but um you could set up a I patreon like where it's more of like a for-profit donation you yeah. just put a couple of the blogs up there locked, you know, a yeah. membership blog or something. I mean, I would I would pay to see what's going on. <laughs> there are far Behind more, the there are far many, many people who are better businessmen when it comes yeah. to figure out that kind of stuff than I am, my friend. <laughs> so, but yeah, there's definitely, we can definitely do better, for sure, always. Well, it's definitely a fascinating story, and th thank you for, for doing it all. And. I mean, it's. I, I just know that people are going to be fascinated by it because I mean, the first time that I had heard about it, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa you're doing what? <laughs> That's like the response that you get, and and it's cool. I hope I hope that you can do more to like, like I would love for you to set up this thing in in Gainesville, and um, you know, if there's anything we can do to to help you do that, like. Just, I just it. definitely make Gainesville in the in the running for the, yeah. the consideration because I think I, I think with with the environment that we have here, the entrepreneurial environment, environment, the artistic environment, um, and even the first response environment, yeah. like I think it's I think a, it would be a great. It's place. a great place to. I mean, if that came to fruition, a great place to bring your teams for businesses yeah, to come. Course. You know, it's better than an escape room. It's yeah. a little bit more realistic, um, especially. Well, I'm I mean, at least from a business standpoint. I'm saying to get something truly out of, you know, if something bad happened. Oh, I'm gotcha. extremely limited across the board in all of those areas. And I've tried to do a few things, you know, over the last like five, seven years to just learn, you know, a little bit. But something like that would be a lot more easily for me to opt in and want to go do it and learn along with people like Colin and have a beer and, you know, no, I, I think, think it's so you, smart. Like, sit here and you could like learn how to pick a lock, right? Yeah. And, like, be okay. great. Actually, it's actually a super useful skill in point of fact, but it's, you know, we, we, we use them like as allegorical lessons. Like to, yeah. if you have the tools when you're stuck to not freak out, exactly. you know, like, same thing like flex cuffs. Like when you, people get trapped like this, they just, they go into like animal mode and they stop thinking. But if you learn how, how easy it is to get out of those things and you've got the skills and like the tool set to, to keep you calm, it, it changes the game. But I want to teach people like that bag you know, it, it's bulletproof. I have a med kit, I have a tourniquet. So if something happens, I can potentially help people. And that, that, that like, I love that feeling, I love that capability. That, that, I get a high off that, right? I think it'd be cool to share. In Gainesville, I couldn't agree with you. I think that the, the talent here, I mean, with Shans, and my medical director for Tactivate is, is Gainesville. You know, he, he's, he's the medical director, I believe, for, for Gainesville Fire. I'm not sure what, what he's up to here locally, but he, medical director for everyone, and he's, he's local. My, my girlfriend is, is at Shans as well. And, uh, and I know the folks at UF and the engineering department are looking up at standing up a uh, like disaster response engineering capability. So there's a lot of serendipity. Um, I think it, it makes a whole lot of sense from a, a capacity perspective. But from a business perspective, at least the models that we know, it would be a new type of environment. Yeah. And things like the seasonality kind of kind of scare me a little bit. Um, plus the time frame, limited time frame here. Yep. But yeah. Very cool. What do you see as as next, I mean, is is that like the focus now? Like, I mean, because are you, are you out of Puerto Rico? We literally just phased out of Puerto Rico officially, completely, as of about four days ago. Okay, uh, so you're you're out, you're home. My truck's still there. Moved out. Other than that, you know, I got to figure out to get that that baby back here with about two thousand dollars in parking tickets on her, which I have to clear before I get her off the island. Uh, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but other than that, yeah, we are we are done. Okay. So, so, so you come back. Is it like, do you get a break, or are you like right into the next thing? And uh, you know, we're, we're in hustle mode. You know, yeah. I'm here in Gainesville. I've been traveling a lot, um, touching base with, with kind of old, old collaborators. Um, we really want to get this project. I kind of talked about up and running. Uh, we want to do it in a way that's beyond my capability and beyond Tactivate's capability. So we're we're looking to strategically partner with some folks, and I'm kind of seeking that out, uh, both from a location perspective. Uh, we're talking to some, you know, all kinds. I'm involved with an incredible community called the Defense Entrepreneurship Forum, which are these, all these guys who are completely like bucking the system from within. Um, so we're just touching base all these networks and communities and re kind of socializing what we're up to and seeing where the best place is for us to land and, and who, who we're going to partner with to do this. Okay. It, I mean, if somebody hears this and they want to help or contact you, I mean, yeah. do you want. Sure. A, is there a website or something that they can that, get? We do have a website. Okay. <laughs> uh, it is uh, tactivate.com and uh, email is jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at tactivate.com. Okay. Uh, you know, we, I think we are on Twitter, which we don't do much. We are on Instagram, we don't do much, but we're really kind of off social. 
Okay. No. Well, that's because you're in areas <laughs> <laughs> with limited communications, it sounds like. It sounds like it could be tough. The Wi-Fi signal might not be working when yeah, we, <laughs> he's we, in one we, of these We areas. create them. <laughs> Well, dude, thanks again so much for being here. Um, incredible story, definitely. I mean, if you can help this guy like with this, inc all these incredible things going on, definitely do so. Connect with him. Um, and I mean, you have anything else, man? Not really. I'm just excited to see uh, see what's next. Yeah, I'm excited to yeah. see what comes out of it too. Well, our video for one. Let's yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, uh, cool. keep keep an eye out for that for a video that we'll be working on. Um, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to drop too much. I feel like I think it's, it's too early. Too for early, that. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, uh, but but stay tuned. Maybe we'll share it on the podcast Facebook page and stuff when it's done. <laughs> after that goes viral, then ends up being how we make hundred hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, well, thanks so, guys. Really appreciate yeah, it. It's an absolutely. Honor. Thank you guys in Gainesville world. Thank you so much for listening. This is the WHOA GNV podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go whoa. We will see you later. <laughs>